Hello, dear friends. My name is Raisa Savchenko. I'm a literature researcher and Holocaust historian from Ukraine. Our topic today is the Holocaust short stories by Tadeusz Borowski. We will try to investigate the life in the camps from the perspective of the non-Jewish survivor. And firstly, I want you to get acquainted with some facts from the biography of Tadeusz Borowski. How do you think did Tadeusz Borowski looks like? Please choose your variants. Here we are. The right variant is B. So firstly, about the fates of the parents of Tadeusz Borowski. His parents had already suffered from the actions of the Soviet authorities. Borowski's father was imprisoned in Gulag because he was a member of the Polish military organization during World War I. And his mother was deported to the settlement in Siberia during collectivization. At those times, Tadeusz lived with his aunt. In 1932, the Borowskis were expatriated to Poland by the Polish Red Cross in an exchange for communist prisoners. They settled in Warsaw. In Nazi-occupied Poland later, Borowski was involved into underground education system. In such a way, he finished school and entered the university where he studied Polish literature. The underground education network was very wide throughout Poland at those times. Also, Borowski met Maria Rundo, who became the love of his life. One day in 1943, she did not return home, and Borowski began to suspect that she had been arrested. Instead of keeping away from their usual meeting places, Tadeusz came straightly into the trap where Gestapo agents waited for him. It was the home of one of his friends, where they usually used to be guests, and there he was arrested by Gestapo. Firstly, he was imprisoned in Paviak prison and later sent to Auschwitz. Except Auschwitz, Borowski was held also in such camps as Daut Mergen, subcamp Natzweiler, Struthof, and later Dachau. He was liberated by Americans on May the 1st, 1945. After liberation, Tadeusz Borowski began to write short stories in which he depicted his Holocaust experience. There are three main volumes of short stories by Tadeusz Borowski. Firstly, We Were in Auschwitz from 1946, Farewell to Maria, and The World of Stone from 1948. And Farewell to Maria has the English title This Way for the Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. It's the name of one of the short stories, which is the first in this collection. There is also one posthumous collection of stories, which is called Red May, published in 1953. And this collection is marked by communist propaganda. For some years, Borowski was really enchanted by communism and thought it was the only power to prevent any Auschwitz in the future. But very soon after the arrest of his friend, he became disillusioned about the socialist regime. And today we are paying attention mainly to his collection of stories this way for the guests, ladies and gentlemen. The stories by Borowski are told in the first person by a narrator who is known as Tadeusz or Tadek. At least in three stories we meet this narrator. The narrator seems to be especially cynical about all the camp's matters. Of course, the author's person should be divided from that of the narrator. The genre of the stories remains to be ambiguous, and we could ask a, a, a question, are they the memoirs or the historical fiction? Anyway, while reading, a reader should embrace the ambiguity of the stories, dividing the narrator's and the author's points of view. As texts operating with the conventions of memoir, they are genuinely marked by the suffering that Borowski witnessed personally. Describing the reality of the camps meets the invention of new language, so-called Lagersprache, 
words are deprived of their expected meaning and the new language is created. And it's interesting to observe the traces of this new language. The first story, This Way for the Guest, Ladies and Gentlemen, introduces us to a world where words metamorphose into new words. Terms like Muslim, Muslim or Canada indicate the special camp discourse. So one new word, Canada, meant well-being in the camp, the group of temporary privileged few who unload the transports of people heading for the guest chambers. The members of Canada could take for themselves most of the victim's possession, mostly food because the gold and diamonds were taken by the SS and sent to Berlin. And so the narrator Tadek, he is also one of the members of this Canada group. Another term, Muslim, was the term used in Nazi extermination camps to refer to those suffering from a combination of starvation and exhaustion, as well as those who were resigned to their impending death. Usually Muslims were not able to move and only laid in the prone position. These victims usually suffered from muscular atrophy, which was compared to one of the real Muslims' positions while praying. And it was a kind of derogatory word. When the narrator wonders what happens if there are no more transport, his friend Henry responds, they can't run out of people or we'll starve to death in this blasted camp. All of us live on what they bring. Generally speaking, the camp universe is represented as caste-shaped society where non-Jewish prisoners sometimes have more privileges. For example, the narrator, the Deutsch has opportunity to receive some packages from relatives or friends. During all the flow of the narrative, the prisoners meet and unload new transports with upcoming victims. They never directly answer the question about what will happen to these people. So really, it is the camp law. People going to their death must be deceived to the very end. This is the only permissible form of charity in the camp. Here is the description of the railway ramp and the typical scenery for the camp. In the description of the load for the trucks, people are in one line with cement and lumber. It shows the process of dehumanization in Borowski stories. Truck drive around, load up lumber, cement people, a regular daily routine. Even some metaphors used by the narrator refer to the brutal reality of the system. Glories as rabid dogs, the wind as a blade of ice. The concentration universe is therefore not only an absolute present, but announces the beginning of a new era, projecting itself into an endless future. There is also a story in this short story about the woman and her child. One woman who came by one of the transport seems to be indifferent to the cries of her child who is coming her up screaming, Mama, Mama. The woman wants to survive and understands that the child would be an obstacle for surviving, so she's ignoring her child. And then one of the prisoners beats this woman and is being praised for it by an SS officer. Good gemacht, good work. That's the way to deal with degenerate mothers. Paradoxically, the narrator, after the work on the ramp, sees a camp as a heaven of peace. And here is the quotation. I lie against the cool, kind metal and a dream about returning to the camp, about my bunk on which there is no mattress, about sleep among comrades who are not going to the guest tonight. Suddenly I see the camp as a heaven of peace. It is true, others may be dying, but one is somehow still alive. One has enough food, enough strength to work. So. He admits that his condition is not too bad. The narrator feels constant fury and has a kind of guilt because of it. He asks one time his friend Henry if they are a good people. And Henry answers, 
the ramp exhausts you, you rebel, and the easiest way to relieve your hate is to turn against someone weaker. So really, his feeling is constant fury. He says, I feel no pity. I'm not sorry they go into the guest chamber. Damn them all. And he admits that it's a kind of pathological. He just can't understand it. Taking part in unloading the transports and deceiving the people up to their deaths makes the narrator a semi-collaborator of the Nazis. Paradoxically, he is at the same time a victim and a perpetrator. The camp continues to be the only real world. Everything behind the wire fences is a temporary illusion. The excitement of the narrator of the waiting the coming transport is suddenly broken by a disgust. The Deus vomits and refuses to unload the train. In this way, we see that Borowski's school detachment during telling the story was a kind of disguise for his guilt, anxiety, and inability to make sense of his painful experience. Another story entitled A Day at Harman's begins on a pastoral note which is soon revealed as ironic. So here's the pastoral description in this story. The shadows of the chestnut trees are green and soft. They sway gently over the ground, still moist after being duly turned over, and rise up in a sea green cupola scented with the morning freshness. The trees form a high palisade along the road. The crowns dissolve in the hue of the sky. This story includes seven anecdotes of greed, pettiness, and self-survival. The brief paragraphs resemble newspaper reports. In this story, A Day at Harman's, the speaker receives 16 loaves from Warsaw, and is far more better than the other prisoners. Again, here comes the caste division in play. In this tale, Unterschaftsführer abuses the couple and the couple abuses the other prisoners. And here is another story, Auschwitz, our home. In this story, the epistle technique is chosen. The narrator, a prisoner at Auschwitz, is writing to his beloved, who is a Polish partisan imprisoned in a women camp. And here we can remember the real story of Borowski and his beloved Maria, who was also imprisoned in Auschwitz. They met again after the war and got married in 1946. So in story Auschwitz, our home, a character is finding a refuge in the dreams about his beloved one. Anyway, the camp cannot be left behind for the moments of tenderness and passion. Here it's the quotation. You know, it feels very strange to be writing to you, you whose face I have not seen for so long. At times I can barely remember what you look like. Your image fades from my memory despite my efforts to recall it. And yet my dreams about you are incredibly vivid. They have an almost physical reality. A dream, you see, is not necessarily visual. It may be an emotional experience in which there is depth and where one feels the weight of an object and the warmth of a body. Generally, in Borowski's Auschwitz universe, humans become cogs in a machine, a commodity to be used and discarded. In the story The World of Stone, the narrator is observing Warsaw ruined by bombings and fires. He feels detached from the universe and at the same time obliged to write the epics about this world chiseled of stone. We see that Tadeusz Borowski himself managed with this task of writing. The ability to write and express even the hardest experience is the creative power which changes the world and can give the possibility of a better future. Unfortunately, Tadeusz Borowski died very early. He committed suicide only when he was 28 years old, soon after the birth of his daughter. So it is a tragic end of his life, 
but he managed fortunately to leave us his short stories where we can see the Holocaust traces and analyze them. Thank you for your attention and see you next time.